Hi. Um, live. Jonathan Stiano here. Sorry, um, a little bit late in starting this broadcast, but um, just talking a little bit about the um, some of the questions I've been asked this week. Um, I thought I'd do this on my general Facebook page, um, and if anyone's out there and they've got any questions, they you're more than welcome to um, post them um, here, and and I will answer them. Um, the, this week we've mainly we had a lot of a lot of inquiries, a lot of questions about tattoo removal, and the advice I normally give to, for people who are thinking about tattoo removal is to um, think about laser first. Laser is usually the first line of treatment of tattoo removal because when it works, it can work well, and um, it doesn't often doesn't scar. It's not not doesn't usually scar, although it can scar, but doesn't usually give scarring and it can, it can give um, good results but I understand that often it doesn't work completely and you often get a, an image of the, the original tattoo I understand it's quite painful and, I, and it also can require several treatments now we don't offer laser tattoo removal at the clinic so if someone inquires we always say look try laser first but if you've tried laser then excision might be an option which is what we do at the clinic and that involves basically cutting the tattoo out um, as if it was a, a, a mole or a birthmark and the, the, the there are limitations with uh, tattoo removal by excision and just try and think of it as if you can pinch the skin then um, then you can then you can remove the tattoo by excision um, but if you can't pinch the skin together then you might not be able to um, remove that tattoo um, completely by excision but what you can do if you can't remove the tattoo completely then you can do what's called a serial excision which means you um, remove as much as you can stitch it up it's often quite tight once you stitched it up and um, and then you can go back um, another day after you usually wait a few months for the skin to relax and then you can cut out a bit more um, and that's called a serial excision and sometimes you need several several goes at it. The sort of tattoos inquiries we've had this week, we've got someone with a large tattoo on the shoulder and I know um, I know you've said you don't mind how many excision, how many times it needs to be operated on, you don't mind having scars, multiple scars, but I'm afraid your tattoo is too big. Um, it covers the whole shoulder and uh, coming down over this muscle here which we call the deltoid um, and it's a, a sort of tribal band sort of design and I know you've said you don't mind how many scars you have I wouldn't cut it out separately I wouldn't cut each bit of black out separately and give you lots of different scars I'd cut it out and give you one scar um, but that means I would take out the intervening skin and it would just be too big I'd, even with serial excision I just think it's too big and I just think it's not amenable to excision I'm sorry about that other tattoos we've had the circumferential tattoo around the ankle which we've had quite a lot of laser and has had actually scarred from the laser and you're saying that it's got keloid scarring from the laser it worries me if you're performing keloid scar because that means if I do excision then I might cause more um, keloid scarring but um, looking at the photos it doesn't look like keloid scarring and so it may not be keloid. You could certainly come to the clinic and we could talk about it, but it would give you a circumferential scar around your ankle, which might not be very good. Also, there is a bit of a width to the tattoo, so it um, may not come out all in one go. You might have a scar with a bit of tattoo on either side, which you might be okay with, but if you're not okay with, you might need another, another session after a few months. And lastly, there's the tattoo on the lower back. Um, that, uh, there's a, the, that is amenable to excision. It's not a great area for... Um, a scar but the tattoo is only well about that big and so that sort of thing can be excised although it would need more than one go I think at least two maybe three goes so those are the tattoo excision questions we've, we've had the, this week um, also had an inquiry about implants size of implants and I get asked about size of breast implants I get asked about this a lot to the extent that I've actually done a video so um, I've done a video um, which I will be putting onto YouTube in the next few days about sizes of implants and people say oh should I have 350cc moderate profile or should I have a 
for 20 cc high profile. I can't, I can't remember what the exact figures were. Um, it's really hard to talk about whether you should have a certain implant um, without an examination and without going through things in the clinic because you have to really look at the size of your chest because the width of your chest, I'll talk about this in the video, the width of your chest will dictate what size of implant you can have because it's the width of the implant which I think is the most critical measurement of an implant. It's the, it's the diameter of the implant, the width. Um, then you look at the shape and the profile and then once you've got the width of the chest which is set and once you've got the shape and profile that you like, so round or teardrop and profiles low, medium, high and extra high. So once you've chosen a certain profile and a certain uh, shape, where, then you put your, your breast width into it and that gives you a volume of implant. Um, or, or at least you've got a choice of one or two. Um, so in fact, although there's lots of implants available, often you'll find that there'll only be a limited a number of implants that will be suitable for you. So this is why you really need to go through it in a consultation with a surgeon and, and, and have measurements and uh, look at the shapes and profiles and sometimes it comes down to a compromise. Sometimes people want a big size but they want a more natural look which is associated with the lower profiles or the teardrop implants which therefore carry with them less volume. So sometimes you have to compromise between size uh, and volume and in cases like that when people want a big size but they want the, the, the softer look in the upper pole and a more natural look I would if my advice I mean you can you can as long as you know you know know what you want and you can choose whatever you want but my advice would always be to look at the shape the shape is more important and if you don't want too much fullness in the upper pole then have that slightly smaller implant which is slightly softer in the upper pole if that's what you want um, and accept that it will be a bit smaller than you might uh, have liked because the, it's worse to say, look, I really want this size and get the size that you like. Um, but if it's too rounded and too full in the upper pole and you don't like the look of it, you're not going to be happy. Um, so I would always advise that you go with the, the, the shape that you want. And if you don't want it too round, and if you do want it round, that's fine. Um, but if you don't want it too round, then go with the, um, go with the shape is more important. Shape is more important than volume. Uh, but everyone fixates on the volume and talks to their friends about the volume and uh, the fact is that if you have a 300cc implant that could be loads of different shapes. You could have a low profile teardrop, you could have an extra high profile round. Both being a 300cc implant, both would look totally different. That's why you need to have a consultation. So as I say, I'm doing a, I'm doing, well I've done a video on that. It's just a question we've got to do the formatting or whatever and get it out on video on YouTube. I've also, my webinar talks about this actually. Um, the other thing that we've had this week is someone was asking about drains with tummy tucks. Do I use drains with tummy tucks? The answer is yes, I do use drains with tummy tucks. The reason being that there is quite a bit what we call a dead space. There's quite a bit big space there because um, when you do a tummy tuck, you have to undermine all the way up to the, to the breastbone. So there is a space. So I put a drain in that space. I am well aware that a lot of people don't put drains in that space. And... Uh, interestingly, some of the meetings I went to recently, they're talking about this, um, and it's something that I've, I'm going to look at. Um, and people are using glue. I'm not. I'm not convinced the glue will hold personally. And the worry is that if the glue doesn't hold, then the that then there becomes a space, and that space can fill with fluid, using the form of what's called a seroma which can be a bit of a nuisance. It's not a disaster, but it's just a bit of a nuisance. I know drains are a bit of a nuisance, so you could balance the two up, but um, that's why I don't use drains. But uh, there is talk, um, certainly internationally, people are talking about suturing, using sutures, and something we do in the back when we do breast reconstructions, take tissue from the back, and we do what's called quilting, which is closing the, the dead space down with stitches. So... Watch this space, but at the moment I do use drains um, with tummy tucks. Um, oh, and the other one was um, someone who inquired. I'm really sorry, you probably noticed something in my car, so I haven't got my details here. But there's someone who inquired about a scar on the head, um, wanting to know whether they could um, have something done for the scar on the head. Scar revision is really tricky. People think, oh, plastic surgeons can get rid of scars, and often people come to see me with a scar and say, can you get rid of the scar for me? I can't get rid of the scar. No one can get rid of your scar. 
all you can do is change the scar in some way. So if there's a problem with the scar and I think if I change it I can make it better, then I can offer you surgery. But uh, the scar that, um, that you had was actually quite pale um, and it looked pretty good and there's not a lot I can do about it I'm afraid. Um, because I could cut it out and give you a new scar but it will probably fade and go to the same way. If the scar is, when we make scars on the face we try and hide them in the laughter lines. Now often people don't have laughter lines but we know where the laughter lines will come in the future so if the scar is not lying in one of those laughter lines then uh, it's possible to change the orientation of the scar. So that's something that can be done if it was in a bad orientation, this one wasn't. Uh, if the scar is lumpy uh, and unsightly there are things that can be done although you've got to be a little bit careful because number one best thing for scars is time so I would say ideally you've got to wait about a year really for the scar to properly mature before considering having anything done to it if the scar is still a problem at a year the, the, the things that can happen is lumpy and red now these things usually settle the redness can be helped with laser um, the lumpiness, there are things you can do if the scar is slightly lumpy. Massage is good, pressure is good, silicone gel sheeting is good, which you can buy at Boots. Um, then you get into more invasive things like injection of steroid into the scar, That's that can help. It's a little bit painful, but it can help. And lastly, you think about surgery to cut it out. People often come and think surgery is the first thing, but surgery is the last thing really, because you don't want the new, next scar to go lumpy. And you need to distinguish between what's called a hypertrophic scar and a keloid scar. A keloid scar is a big lumpy scar and it's your body's reaction making it lumpy. And those sorts of things you wouldn't cut out. A hypertrophic scar is a raised scar which is um, usually due to um, delayed healing of the scar. So if the, scar, if the wound has taken a long time to heal, it hypertrophies, it overgrows and forms too much scar tissue. So if you've got a history of this, the wound taking a long time to heal, maybe it opened up and took a long, long time to heal, that's actually a good sign and I'd be more likely to cut that out and revise that for you and give you a new scar because I hope that my new scar, if it heals up properly, it won't form this hypertrophic scar where if it healed fine and it just grew lumpy, lumpy, lumpy and it grew really big, that makes me think it might be a keloid scar which might be a tendency of your body to form these scars and so if I cut it out and stitch it up, I'll give you a bigger scar and then that bigger scar can go keloid. So you tend not to operate on those. So, um, yeah. So I hope that ho helps. Those are the inquiries we've had. And, um, oh, Liz, Liz, sorry, I didn't have, I didn't do my, I didn't, didn't do my, um, swipe so I didn't know what was going on there. I, I normally do it on my private Facebook group, this, um, Q&A, so now I'm doing it on the, um, on the non-private bit. Um, hi Liz. Um, so, yeah, those are the questions that I've had this week. Um, probably be doing a similar sort of thing next week. If anyone's got any questions, feel free to, to uh, email Laura or post them on the on the uh, on the Facebook or the Twitter, and uh, I'll I'll, um, I'll answer them next week. So, um, live from my car. Um, Thanks very much for coming. And this is me. Check it. Unless there's any questions, I'm going to check out. In three, in two, in one. Check out.